Hi guys, my name is Jerry and this is episode 20 of the Wildlife Photography Q&A video series in which I answer your wildlife photography questions. Yes, episode 20. Been away for a while. Uh, for those of you that follow me online, and I hope you all do because it's pretty exciting, even if I say so myself. Hey, Marlon. Absolutely. Absolutely. I do. I do. He does. Right. We've been in the Mara. Our Mara season actually wraps up later today, Friday. So we've been in the Mara for nine weeks, which obviously keeps us nice and busy. So it's easy to produce the content for Instagram, Periscope. Go and check out Periscope, guys. It's insane. And, um, but to sit and do these kind of questions, the guys, you guys have been sending in questions all the time. Thank you, thank you. I will get to them. Um, I'm traveling again next Sunday. So hopefully next week, one, maybe two episodes, but I need you to ask your questions. Sure. So, what else has been happening? Um, is we're kind of heading towards the end of the year with we've got a couple of trips left. Timbavati, Madikwes, Wild Shots is coming up. For those of you in Cape Town and Johannesburg, I'll be speaking there. So I look forward to seeing you there. Come and say hi if you are there. What else is happening? Um, there's rugby tomorrow. Yay, spring bucks. Uh, should be interesting. But I think that's all for now. So, Yesterday, on all my social platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, I posted a short little video asking for more questions. I printed a whole bunch of them off. For today, for this one, um, I've printed off all the comments of Instagram and questions, and also ones received via email. So I'm going to run through all the Instagram ones because I am biased to that platform right now. For those of you that are not on there, go and check it out. It is fantastic. I reckon you've got about, what do we know? The, the, the marketing platform, the ad product for Instagram is coming towards the end of the year, beginning of next year. Then you're going to have six months, I reckon, before the marketers ruin everything with ads. Get in there soon. It is a fantastic platform. So um, I'm biased towards that for this episode at least. And I'm going to go with those questions and one or two from email as well. So good to be back. Let's get epi into episode 20. Here we go. Lucas asks on Instagram, I have one question. How often do you use continuous autofocus? Lucas, the short answer to this question is always. I always, always have my cameras on auto, um, autofocus and continuous because with wildlife, anything can happen at any time. So it's pointless to me to have to sh swap, swap, swap coffee. You have to swap between continuous and single focus. The thing is, if you can include back button focus in your focusing arsenal, it's very easy to hold it down, continuously focus on a moving subject, and when that subject goes stationary, I'm still on continuous focus, but I can release my back button because my focus is set. So the short answer to your question is all the time. There are some, and there's quite a few actually, questions on back button focus, which um, I'm thinking of doing like an episode specifically on autofocus and also specifically on, on gear, um, photographic equipment, because a lot of people ask, what lenses must I buy and so on. So, Autofocus continues for me all the time, but I do combine it with back button focus. I uh, hope that helps, but I've got nothing else on that, eh? All the time. Damon asks on Instagram, if you had to recommend one lens for wildlife photography, either being Canon or Sigma, what would it be and why? Damon, the way in which you ask this question makes me think that you already have an answer to it. <laughs> yeah? which, which lens, either Canon or, or Sigma, should you buy for wildlife photography? I mean, it's, how long is a piece of string thing again? What is your budget? Do you have enough money to go buy a 200, 400, or the new 400 2.8 Canon? Or are you looking more mid-range? Because if it's mid-range, you, you're tossing up between 100, 400, the new version, or then the, what's the Sigma, the 50 to 500. Then there's Tamron, 150 to 600. So somewhere in there, it's horses for courses, guys. It's budget, how often you're gonna use it, and what you're shooting. If you're shooting birds, you need more length, yeah? So Damon, uh, 100 to 400, I would probably go for, um, if I had the money, because I, 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 choose, I, I prefer to stay native with my camera again, stay with the brand. But make no mistake, there's nothing wrong with the Sigmas and the Tamarons. The new stuff they're putting out, very, very impressive. So Damon, if you can give me, if you want to email me a budget and you and I can discuss what fits into that budget best for you, and then you go and purchase, you can do that, but for now, I think you've made up your mind already. TC Travel asks on Instagram, how do you meter for that leopard in a tree photo when the sky behind is white and featureless? This is an interesting question, TC Travel Photos on Instagram, because it's a situation we find ourselves in often, 
in wildlife photography. Whether it's a leopard in a tree, like in this example, or whether it's a bird up in a tree with a bright sky behind. Now, on the last couple of migration trips that I ran, one of the things we focused on a lot, a lot, is exposure and exposure compensation in the field. And it's, it was quite surprising how many accomplished, whether they think for themselves or in the real life, photographers struggle with the concept of when to over and when to underexpose. So this is the example image you sent me. Nice one, leopard up in a tree, bright background. The question you have to ask yourself in situations like this is, do I want to expose for the leopard? Yeah, because then you're gonna have to overexpose to bring it back up. The background will be blown out, yeah? But the story, the narrative in this frame revolves around the cat. If you have a very dramatic background and you wanna expose for that more, then you would kind of overexpose or underexpose it a bit. The cat will be dark, but you will have your sky looking good. So in your example, which I'm assuming that the detail is in the cat that you want, I would be happy to blow out that background. You have no choice. Alternatively, and this is a whole separate discussion from a processing point of view, is expose, look at your entire frame and expose for the majority. Look at what the most content and, and, and information in that frame is. Expose for that because you can then take the smaller part, for example, the small leopard, the small bird in the frame, and you can lift that up in post-processing, dodging and burning. Yeah, so there, there's a couple of things, but for your example, I would frame it as you have it, and I would overexpose slightly to make the cat look natural, regardless of what happens to the background, because in this image, the background doesn't really support the image at all. So uh, I hope that helps. If you, I think auto, uh, well, not auto, exposure compensation is something that we need to discuss as well. So if some of you have tried that and you have specific questions with examples, send them in and let's have a look. But um, yeah, again, I would expose for the cat, which means overexposing slightly in your example and blow out that sky. There's nothing there to look at. Jamal asks on Instagram, show the picture of a horse, please. Jamal, um, I'm not sure what to make of your question and I'm not sure what horse picture you would like to see. Sorry, can't help you there. Martin asks via email, would you crop an image further knowing it was only going on social media or do you consider each image worthy of printing and limit your cropping? Martin, this is a very, very good question, actually, because I think a lot of people confuse, and Nick, if you're watching this, I'm, I'm going to get to your question at some stage with regards to sizing of exports and what it's for. Am I happy to crop an image more than usual because I know it's for social media? Yes, personally, absolutely. The difference is this, guys. If you export an image for social media or online use, yeah, your resolution is smaller, 72 DPI, sometimes 96. You can't see a difference, it's up to you. When you do a print image, it's 300 DPI. So what that means, without getting too technical, if I sharpen, for example, an image of 72 DPI for web, I can over sharpen it, and those kind of formats for web is very forgiving on sharpness of an image. I can have a pretty soft image at 300. I can pull it down, over sharpen, and make it work for social. Yeah. Now this is, okay, let me go off on a sidetrack just for a moment. I think there's a lot of people out there who have built a pretty good name for themselves on images online, but if you were to look at their real world images, print quality, you might be a little bit disappointed. Hmm, did I just say that? I did, sorry, but that's the truth, right? So I'm personally, yes, I'm happy because obviously I'm hedging a lot on my social media presence and my platforms as a gateway drug to me and the services I offer. Yeah? So I'm happy to go that route of cropping too much because it works for a blog or for Instagram and then sharpen it so it looks fantastic online. So I'm happy for that. Do I, what did you ask? Sorry, do you consider, I don't, I don't consider every single print I do, image I do print worthy. Absolutely not. I think anybody who does it is, is, is quite silly really because there's images where someone might want to buy a print but then you've put it out online and you can't print it. So you need to be careful of that. That's a dangerous thing to run, because now you put out this, come and buy this marvelous print from me uh, based on what I've posted on my Facebook page, but in the real life, if you print that, it's gonna look shitty because it's soft. Um, so if you're happy to do that, that's cool. Just be aware that every single image you take will not always work for print because of softness, size, noise. Take a pic, and I'm happy for those. But um, personally, yeah, 
I'm quite happy to do sharpen and to crop just for social because of the importance I put on those platforms from my business point of view. Um, hope that helps you. You did have another question as well, Martin, with regards to black and whites in Lightroom. I'm going to be doing that as a standalone tutorial early next week, so stay tuned for that one. Michael asks on Instagram, have you ever been in a situation when you couldn't assist a guest or didn't know how to answer a question, for example, camera settings? And how do you maintain knowledge of both Nikon and Canon gear when it is constantly evolving or guests using older equipment? Michael, thank you for this question. Because I think if you scratch a little bit deeper than just the actual question, there's a lot of stuff from an industry, a photographic safari industry point of view that becomes interesting. Have I ever had a question that I couldn't answer for a guest? I'm sure I have. I think the biggest mistake anybody who's in my position of... Um, educating, teaching, inspiring, running workshops, running safaris, is that you, 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 you act like you know everything. None of us, not me, not even Marlon, knows everything from a photographer. Well, maybe Marlon. No, it's a, he's just laughing. Okay, so we don't know everything. So if you don't know something, it is your responsibility and your duty to tell the guest or your client or the group that you're teaching. Sorry, I don't know, but, and this is something I did when I was guiding as well, I would always say to someone, I will check it up and I'll get back to you because there's value. You are showing them that you care and you can add value. The, uh, that, <laughs> that said, I can't remember the last time that a question was asked to me in the field that we couldn't eventually work out on the spot. Because why? Has it, um, just think how to, how to word this. Okay, put it this way. I'm very proud, extremely proud of my own ability to be able to teach someone in the field. And I know that the rest of my team, Marlon and the guys as well, are very good at doing that. Right. Um, I would like to think, and I'm quite positive, that we're one of the best in the industry when it comes to teaching people how to improve their photography. This is the difference. Let me tell you this. Is a lot of people go in, and I'll get at, at least to your question, Michael. A lot of people go into this industry because they like wildlife photography. Right? That's cool which means their baseline intent when they go out is to create images for themselves. There's a very, very big difference between wildlife photography or photo safaris and, watch this, the business of wildlife photography and the business of photo safaris. I mean the business of photo safaris, which means I need to do whatever I can to try and stay two, three steps ahead of any questions that I might get. What that means, I invest a lot of time and I, I actually saw an image on Facebook that one of my guests posted from the Mara with me sitting one side of my phone, yeah? I'm always on that. I'm always connected. I'm following links to new reviews. I'm following links to forums. I don't like to get involved because I think it's a pointless exercise to try and argue someone what the best brand is. It's a complete waste of time. But I'm always reading. I'm always aware of what's going on. I might not interact, but I know what's going on. I don't do that for any other reason. I couldn't give a shit what anybody else in the industry thinks of what it is that we're doing. I'm doing it so that I can produce and, and present a better service to my clients. So if there's ever a point where I cannot answer a question, for example, you, you mentioned um, technical specifically settings. If someone might ask me how, I don't know, I can't even think of something. Help. Um, what would happen if I change the aperture here? If I don't know that answer, I'm confident in my ability to be able to kind of reverse engineer. Ask them, what kind of image do you want and why do you want to do the setting? We can then reverse engineer it back and get them to that image that they want. So if there is ever a point, I would say, sorry, I don't know. And if you run trips, for all of you out there, you need to do the same. Don't baffle people with bullshit. It's going to catch up with you. But um, so, yeah, for me, that's a big thing. It's the business of wildlife photography, which I'm in, and the business of photo safaris, which I'm in, and I push, and I make sure that I try and stay as close to what's happening as possible. Then, obviously, there's the teaching skill and the ability to talk out a problem, which is something we can do as well, which is pretty cool. Right. Wow. That's quite a humble brag session there, hey? Okay, I'm going to move away, and I'll carry on with your question now. But, guys, it's true. I mean, if you're good at something, tell someone you're good at something. A lot of people go out and, oh, look at my image. It's, it's, it's half nice. What do you think? Listen, if you think it's a good image, tell people. I just took this image, I think it's fucking phenomenal. You need to be that confident in what you do. 
Right, rant over. I'm going to move on a little bit. Marlon is just smiling at me. Okay, so the, the second question, the second part of your question, um, Michael, was how do you maintain a knowledge of both Nikon and Canon? I'm in the lucky position here that we have a rental stock of both Nikon and Canon equipment, so I get hands-on with it. For, what I will do, for example, is before I go on a trip, I know what, what cameras my guests shoot because they give me that information before they leave. I can then look and say, if it's a private and someone's shooting Canon, I will only take Canon gear to shoot with them because then we speak the same language. So I've immersed myself in that process. Same thing, if I go on a trip where there's six people and I've got three Nikon, three Canon, I will take two cameras. I will shoot a Nikon and a Canon because I can speak the language and I can show them those examples. I do have a problem. I mean, I'm sure all of us who do this has a problem because every bloody time a new camera comes out, they move the buttons around. The menu systems change. But I think it comes back to the, the same thing as well is if you understand the big picture of photography and how aperture, ISO, shutter speed, exposure compensation, frame rates, continuous focus, if you understand in the bigger picture how that works, you can help someone, even if you don't know the camera, you should, on that base foundation knowledge, be able to go into that menu system and talk and work it out because you know if I change something here, you know that this might change. So it is a struggle, it absolutely is, but I'm in the lucky position that I have that both. If it's something, Michael, that you wanna do, then make sure you get your hands on the product and shoot with it as much as possible. It's a language. I can speak Afrikaans and English pretty well, I think. Um, and it's the same. You need to just learn those languages, and that's where the value comes from. Guys, for those of you watching, um, go and check out. Reverse back to where Marlon read this, um, the question, and go and check out Michael's profile on Instagram. There's some pretty cool shots up there. Nice cat action. Right. That was a hell of an answer. Sure. Didn't expect that to go there, but anyway, there it is, Michael. I hope that helps. Right, guys, there we have it. This is episode 20. It's awesome to do this again. Um, I've got a, quite a few ideas for this to roll out. I am going to be doing a lot more content video-based questions like this, but it might be smaller. It might just be a quick one here, an episode like this. I want to get to 50 episodes. I need you guys to help me with this. I do, and again, I said this way back in the, in the beginning when I started this, is I would have given anything when I started to have access to the amount of information that's available currently on the internet. Blogs, videos like this, Instagram information, quick tips and stuff. So part of what I do is creating content for you guys. And, and Marlon, Andrew, Mork, everybody else who's involved with the brand, that's what we're about. We're about giving value there. So use it, please. Send me questions on any of the platforms that's at the end of this video, and we will answer them for you. Right. I think that's about all of it. Marlon, have you got anything to add? No? Jerry is awesome. Okay. It's my best PR agent. No. Go and check out Marlon if you're not on Instagram. Phenomenal stuff. Here's his link. Go and check it out. Otherwise, it is Friday. You guys have a great weekend. Send me your questions, and we will keep on answering them for you. My name is Jerry. I'm from Wild Eye. I'll see you guys next time.